Man all flight quarter station. As the time for the strike drew near, the crew went into action. Some stood by, prepared to cope with a sudden fire. Others readied the planes for the launching. Talker, tell the pilots to man the plane. Aye, aye, sir. Ready room from flight control. Pilots, man your plane. While the flat top turned into the wind, the pilots prepared for the takeoff. For some of the new pilots, this was it. With everyone on the mark, the strike was officially begun. Stand by to start engine. Stand clear of propellers. Start engine. Each man on the ship had a specific assignment. No matter how small, each job had to be performed without a hitch, or the entire operation would be upset. Finally, with its wings unfolded and locked into place, the lead plane was all set to go. Sometimes, when there wasn't much wind, the planes could not be launched in the usual way. But there was no need to postpone the strike. In that kind of weather, a catapult was used to push the planes into the air. Throughout World War II, U.S. carrier-based planes kept up a steady attack against the enemy in the Pacific. Carrier pilots flew tens of thousands of sorties against enemy shipping, aircraft, and land bases. In a great percentage of cases, the enemy targets could be reached only by carrier-based planes. Returning from a strike, the airmen flew the most direct course back to that welcome speck on the sea. Taking the planes back aboard was an even more exacting operation than the launching. Once a pilot was given a come ahead, he didn't waste any time getting himself and his plane back onto the flight deck. The landing signal officer guided him in. Once again, every part of the operation had to be accomplished with great speed. While the flat top was taking her planes aboard, she was vulnerable to enemy attack since she could not maneuver. The planes had to be landed in the shortest possible space of time. Once a plane was safely aboard, the deck was prepared for the next arrival in a matter of seconds. The returning aircraft were quickly moved to their assigned positions on the flight deck. On a carrier in action, deck space was at a premium. Every available square foot was utilized. Sometimes the landing signal officer had a real cause for worry. Firefighters and other crewmen moved fast. An accident really upset the landing pattern, especially when there was more than one plane in distress. 
Sometimes a pilot in trouble wouldn't even try to make the ship. Rockets had to be jettisoned. Then the airmen made ready to leave the plane as soon as it hit. This would have to be the most skillful landing of his career. The downed pilot was in luck. Once out of the plane, the pilot had a rubber life raft handy to make his stay in the water a good deal safer and more comfortable. During World War II in the Pacific Theater, hundreds of carrier pilots were able to cheat death, thanks to the equipment which the Navy had provided for such situations. If necessary, the pilot could exist for an extended period on the raft inasmuch as he was well supplied with food and water, as well as preparations for combating the elements. But for a pilot who had been spotted by a fellow American airman, the stay in the raft would not be a long one. The Air Sea Rescue Service could be counted on to function quickly. In a very short time, a Navy patrol plane would arrive, and the downed pilot's troubles were just about over. In some cases, depending of course on the location, a pilot who was forced to ditch his plane was picked up within an hour and none the worse for the experience. In no time at all, he would be back at a base, ready to become part of another Flat Top's complement of flyers. 